Alright, so what I've got for you today is without a shadow of a doubt the most anticipated match of StarCraft 2 of the last couple of years. Oddly enough, both of these players dodged each other in tournaments left, right and center of the last couple of years. Too much of a disappointment on my side at the very least, because I would have loved to see these guys face off against each other many times before. But at the very least, it finally happened. So let's get started like we always do by introducing both of the pro gamers. Because spawning here in the top right hand corner of Pillars of Gold, we are looking at none other than Maru's main command center. Maru, of course, the most dominant StarCraft 2 player from South Korea of the last couple of years. This man has won close to like a million dollars in prize money at this point. Now, the same can be said for his opponent, except the fact that he has been the most dominant StarCraft 2 player outside of South Korea of the last couple of years. Playing here with the Red Zerg drones in the opposite corner, we have none other than Saro. Now, when it comes to series and matches that both of these guys have played in the past, right? It's an extremely short list, which is so crazy when you think about it, because they have long been like the number one and the number two players on like the leaderboards in SC2, right? But sadly enough, they've only faced off against each other and handful of times. So first time that they faced off was during the WESG 2017. At that point, it was Maru who ended up winning 3-0 over Serral. However, you got to put an asterisk next to that series because that is right before Serral became the player that he is today. Um, at the time, Serral was obviously a highly ranked Zerg player from Europe. I mean, a very promising Zerg player from Europe, but he wasn't quite at that level that we know him to be at today. Secondly, they faced off in 2018 during the GSL versus the World competition in a best of one series. So that, mean they, that, that means they literally played one map, which, I mean, it was won by Serral. It was won by Serral in a 1-0 uh, to zero fashion, as you may have already guessed. Uh, but it wasn't really the best map ever, and it really wasn't the best game of StarCraft 2 that we have ever seen. Other than that, since 2018, these two guys have not faced off against each other. Isn't that crazy? I, I still can't quite wrap my head around it, right? So there have been many tournaments where they both participated. They were sometimes even like very close to each other in the bracket. And even if it seemed impossible, they somehow some way managed to dodge each other in those events. So yesterday, or actually two days ago, if you're watching this on the day that this video goes live on the Saturday, um, this series was played as part of the Alpha X what is it? The Alpha X King of Battles tournament, if I'm not mistaken, where both of these guys decided to participate. They were both put in the same group. And luckily for us as StarCraft fans, it finally occurred. Now, full transparency, I did, of course, as a StarCraft 2 fan, watch this series live because I couldn't resist. I didn't actually know that they would be releasing the replays, so that's uh, that's a good thing, right? I'm, I'm very glad to see that I can already go ahead and cast this series. Uh, but as a StarCraft fan, I do already know who ends up winning this series. Uh, but that really shouldn't take away too much from the excitement because, well, I can already promise you, this is probably the highest match of Zerg versus Terran you're gonna pretty much ever see. Both of these guys are so ridiculously good at playing this game. Now, here's the thing though. A lot of people would describe both of these players' as play styles as quote-unquote boring, right? So generally speaking, in real-time strategy games, it's the player who plays defensively who comes out ahead, assuming you don't die to stupid stuff, right? So say, for example, in the case of Zerg, if you can squeeze out just a couple more drones and you can let those mine for just a couple more seconds, that income advantage adds up very, very quickly. And because of that, assuming you don't die to stupid stuff, it is generally accepted to be the fact that, you know, the defensive player does come out ahead in the long run. Now, both of these guys are extremely good at just not dying to stupid timing attacks. And because of that very reason, I mean, you can already see Maru is feeling confident to go for the triple CC opener before starting up the starport. Uh, this is one of those builds that can really only be done if you are very, very good at microing your early game units, but also very good at scouting exactly what it is your opponent is going for. You're always, in a game of StarCraft 2, you're always dealing with limited information, and you gotta make the best of, uh, of the situation with that limited information. Now, obviously, you can go ahead and sacrifice an Overlord. So, Serral right now knows indeed that it is gonna be a starport transition. He knows that a Liberator is coming up, or a Viking, or a Medivac, but it's pretty much always gonna be a Liberator at this point. He starts up a couple of Spore Crawlers, and even these are going up at such a ridiculously late time, right? So, he saw the starport was producing there for, uh, for a little bit, but only just now is when you really started up the Spore Crawlers. Now you need to know this timing for every single map. For every single one of the Terran strategies that they can play. Look at this. This is so beautiful. 
as a StarCraft fan, like, look at that. That spore crawler right there gives me chills, okay? <laughs> it doesn't look like a lot, but if you make that spore crawlers five seconds earlier, you lose five seconds of potential mining time, and therefore, uh, you know, you lose about five minerals, right? So it adds up very quickly uh, if you uh, put all of those little moves together. Now the Hellions decide to dive on top of that main ramp. Liberator ugh, decides to see up in a bit of a peculiar spot. I don't think it's going to be able to get too much done. Hellions were also thwarted there, so Serral is going to be A-OK -okay here for the time being. Now, the reason why I brought up the fact that both of them kind of play a boring style is because, you know, I don't really want you to expect any fireworks in the earlier stages of the game. I mean, Maru, very well known actually for going for proxy 3 Rex rushes, especially against opponents that he deems to be, you know, stronger against, so that's pretty much everyone. Uh, but he really does enjoy going for the triple cheeses. Um, it, it happens every once in a while, but generally speaking, especially in like a, a situation that we are in right here, in game number one, you will probably see them play a more, you know, defensive approach pretty much every single time. Just trying to squeeze out as much economy as they possibly can, so the game gets forced to go into the mid match or into the, the mid-match? The, the, the mid-game. Usually you can use match and game, you know, in, in, in a cast, but mid-match doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Well, maybe it does, actually. Anyways, so, very standard opener here from both players. We do see that plus one, plus one infantry upgrade. Armory comes up at the perfect time as well, so he can go straight into 2-2 if he wants to. Combat shield is coming up right after the stim pack upgrade has already been researched. So Maru is going to be able to start his drop harassment. In the meantime, on the side of the Zerg player, we did see that very quick lair. So Serral favoring the Spire there pretty quickly. Also getting himself that bailing nest with the bailing speed really, really early on. So this bailing speed upgrade is super helpful. It's pretty much critical to defend a lot of Terran timing attacks. It might be a little bit early in this particular case. Honestly, he could have delayed that for a little while longer. But this is... Probably the most important upgrade, actually, that a Zerg player can get at the uh, the earlier to mid stages of a game. Uh, you really need to try and get yourself that bailing speed upgrade out so you can actually defend against Terran pushes when they are very, very close to the creep. Now, one nice thing, right? If you keep those Hellions alive, you can obviously build that armory to go into 2-2 upgrades. Wouldn't be surprised at all to see those started up here very shortly, but you can also morph those Hellions into Hellbats, which is very useful, especially in these big battles. Now, you don't have to. Ooh, nice little bit of micro. Should be able to get all of these marines out of there without too much trouble. 11 mutas, though, are starting up. Hmm, okay. So, plus one, plus one has finished here for both players. Would love to see the 2-2 two -two started here uh, for, uh, for, for Maru. I mean, that's a little bit on the later end of things right now. Come on, Maru! I mean, you're only microing like 17 different things at this point. Or not really microing, I guess, but managing like 17 different things at this point. There we go. 2-2 two -two does indeed start up here eventually. Pro gamers are humans, guys. Believe it or not. Now, Maru is very good, just like Clem is, with those Widow Mines. So he's relentless when it comes to spreading around those Widow Mines all over the map. You gotta be so careful that you don't accidentally lose a lot of units. Now the Zerklings decide to come in from the back. Nice pickup right there by Maru. Once again manages to boost away, although the Medivac right there with low hit points. Uh, it is gonna be picked up, so a couple of Marines end up finding the grave here somewhere on the ground. But this Widow Mine got some good connections and reinforcing Marines and Hellions there. Managed to get some nice shots in as well. Alright, so we're eight minutes into this match. Fifth base is being acquired. Fourth command center will probably st okay. I was gonna say yeah, we'll probably uh, be morphing into a planetary here very shortly. Didn't quite see it started up there on the production tab, but all of this makes perfect sense. Usually in this matchup, we see the Zerg player being one or two bases ahead of the Terran player. The main reasoning for that is that Zerg units in general don't really trade very efficiently. So you can see already, I mean, the resources lost here are in favor of the Terran player, meaning that the Zerg player has lost more stuff. And that will probably continue onwards throughout this game. Usually the way that a lot of Zerg players like to approach this matchup at a relatively high level is by trying to contain the Terran player on a certain amount of bases and then just mine more than they can, right? So at this point you can see Maru really hasn't received that much counter pressure here from the Zerg player. Serral is A-OK -okay with the Terran here taking four bases, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's gonna be 
going pretty hardcore into uh, into denying a fifth base, right? So a fifth base uh, is where the Terran player can really start making that late game transition. They can go into Ghost, they can go into Liberators. It's uh, it's super critical to try and deny that if you want to win, uh, you know, before that stage in the game. So usually we see Zerg players expanding, 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 while trying to contain the Terran player and forcing them to mine out the bases that they have. All right, so here's the 2-2 timing attack. Actually, is he gonna go for the 2-2 timing attack? He could. I mean, I love the fact that he still has those Hellions and he also has that Thor now added into the mix, which is fantastic. Serral knows that this is a scary moment for a Terran player to attack with, so he's actually pretending like he wants to go for an engagement here, but now he's mostly backing off once again. Giving him a little bit more time to finish up his own upgrades as well, so you can see the ground carapace there is finishing up on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, which is super helpful because right now he's gonna be able to match those upgrades. Now, one advantage that Terran players have in this kind of scenario... Ooh, actually hold that thought, because a couple of Banelings are trying to go through the Widow Mine... Or, sorry, through those Supply Depot walls. Nicely done there. A couple of SCVs. Nothing too crazy. Uh, but one nice advantage that Terran players have in this matchup is the fact that they don't have to get, you know, an additional structure after already getting the Armory. So you need the Armory to go into plus two, plus two upgrades, but then you can go straight into three, three. For Zerk, you need to be at Hive Tech before you can start up the 3-3 upgrades, meaning that there's gonna be probably like a good minute or so where the Terran player is gonna be hit when it comes to those upgrades, and it makes those Marines especially very, very menacing. Marudo still wants to go onto the creep here for at least a little bit. Immediately, as soon as he leaves his base alone, we do see, well, not quite alone, but we do see a lot of Zerk units running once more for that mineral line. A couple Banelings actually do remain. Oof. Five SCVs there in total, nothing too crazy, but Cerro has been in firm control of this game from basically the very beginning, taking absolutely no damage in the earlier stages, and, uh, well, I mean, it looks like a couple creep tumors, I guess, so maybe technically that isn't absolutely no damage, but he uh, defended that extremely well, and right now he's at that point, right, so happily sitting at 93 workers right now, where he can just simply send wave after wave after wave of Zerg army towards this Terran player. Now, this is, this is nice. I love those Widow Mines. Gotta be a little bit careful here, though, if you are the Terran player. You can accidentally lose, like, an entire mineral line worth, right? So this is an extremely dire scenario here at this point for the Terran, who's desperately trying to take good trades. Now, I do love that. Whenever you're trading Marauders with Banelings, even though, you know, Marauders apparently have to die in the process, it is still a good trade. Banelings by no means are a cheap unit, even though a lot of players seem to think that you can make them for free. Uh, they actually cost quite a lot. They are, of course, very, very supply efficient. Now, the Mutas at this point are clearing a path here as well, but this is very, very scary. Banelings once again get very close there to the Widow Mines. Looks like once more, Cyril is going to be able to disengage. He's now uh, grabbing another base over here. But while this is going on, the fifth base has been acquired by Maru, and this is a really critical one. Whenever Terran goes up to five bases, they can really start remaxing over and over and over again. And they can make that transition to watch either the late game uh, army that's based around Liberators or around Ghosts. Alrighty. So, the 3-3 three, three upgrades here are done for the Terran player. 3-3 three, three is coming up here for the Zerg. The Ultralist Cavern also, uh, also is coming up. Um, one thing that he doesn't have just yet is the Adrenal Glance upgrade, so that is something worth keeping in mind. Adrenal Glance is actually one of the most important upgrades that a Zerg player can get in the later stages of the game. It is sometimes actually forgotten, um, uh, you know, by pro gamers. You see it every once in a while. Usually it started up with 3-3 and Adrenal Glance, which is why I went over there to check. Um, okay, well, we'll have to keep an eye out on there. Anyways, ooh, here we go. Big bailing run by there into the Planetary Fortress. Immediately, a new expansion is gonna be acquired there by Maru, who is now floating over an orbital command. At the same time, he is dealing some counterattack damage over here. Is he gonna be able to kill the base? Okay, he will. Nice little bit of targeting there. Beautiful moves there by Maru. Loses a couple units in the process, but once again, does take very efficient traits. Gotta be careful, though. Ooh, nicely done. Thor uh, drops out of that medivac here first. And he actually picks it up before the Banelings can roll into it. Nicely done. All right. So look at the resources lost, right? This is this is where the games get kind of crazy. So despite the fact that Maru has had an income disadvantage pretty much the entire game, he's been trading like an absolute god. If you micro your Terran units well, the sky is technically the limit. There you go. That's another valuable trade right there for the South Korean Terran. At the same time, the Marines and... Uh, or sorry, the, uh, the Zerklings and the Mutas 
are trying to dive onto the third base, but great reinforcements there by Maru. Now is this uh, base though? Yeah, this base is now an orbital, so not quite ideal. Zerklings and uh, and Banelings are going to be significantly better when it comes to taking that one off. Okay. Once again, good counsel there. Serral, uh, at the very least, doesn't lose a ton of money here, but this is starting to become a bit of a problem. Like, he actually still has not started up Adrenal Glands. Zerklings. Um, dude, I actually, I'm actually starting to be a little bit worried. Like, we can talk about what's going on in the game, but he still has not started up Adrenal Glands, and that's a really big upgrade to miss out on. So, it's basically like a 40% attack speed buff for Zerklings. Usually, like I said, you start it up with plus 3, plus 3. And then you just click the... Uh, the, the like, there's no reason at, at this point in the game to click the spawning pool. Right? Why would you do that? You don't really have any particular reason to click the spawning pool anymore. So, he probably clicked on it, but didn't have the resources for it or something along those lines at the time. And because of that, he may very well be forgetting it. I, I hope he's going to check for that in just a little bit. I actually didn't notice that uh, when I watched this... Uh, this series life. It's a, a super critical upgrade and it would certainly be a very painful situation for the Zerk player to be in if you forget one of the most important ones. It's like forgetting, uh, you know, Stimpak. Anyways, Zerklings are basically everywhere. Once again, as soon as the Terran's uh, attention here is on the right side of the map, the Zerklings run into the fourth base. 34 SCVs have gone down at this point. A couple more mules though decide to land there despite the Zerkling threat still being present. But I guess that the Zerklings are going to be cleaned up here eventually. Alrighty. So, here's the late game transition from Maru. He decides to go for the Ghost. Now, in case you watched my... Uh, I, <laughs> I posted this live game a couple days ago on the YouTube channel. I'll go ahead and post a link to it down below uh, in, uh, in the description of this video. It was basically a game of me playing Zerk vs. Terran where I got a little bit salty specifically because of the Ghost, right? Now, here we go once again. Big Zerk push. There we go. Nicely done. Kills that planetary fortress. But Maru, I mean, he wants more. He keeps taking efficient traits. And I really want to hammer on that. Apparently, he now wants to acquire the base in the top left hand corner. It's a little bit of an awkward scenario because a hatchery already has been planted down at that exact location. And drones are already gathering, uh, gathering those minerals. Um, but uh, anyways, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because the ghosts, they're kind of my worst nightmare, okay? When I play StarCraft 2. So, their steady targeting ability allows them to deal really, really well with Ultralisks and Brute Lords in particular. But they also have a spell called EMP, and especially with Enhanced Shockwaves Research, they can EMP Vipers and also Infestors very easily. Meaning that, since they're also kind of good against Lurkers, right? They're, they're basically the ultimate counter to late game Zerg. They have a lot of potential, so at this point there are 11 of them out on the field already. They're actually surprisingly beefy units too, so they can take a couple of hits from a Baneling, which is real nice. Still though, Serral is all over this map, but he is starting to lose some of his bank. Earlier on, he had a lot of minerals and gas in the bank, and at this point, it's kind of been, you know, slowly emptying. He's still maxed out at this point, but he needs to start taking some more efficient trades. 47 SCVs here have gone down at this point in the game, but this is like... What feels to be one of the first times that Maru is actually making like a relatively big move out. Here we go, steady targeting on that Ultralisk and it got picked off pretty much right away. Banelings though! Ooh. Well, I think he had actually an opportunity there to blow up these ghosts, but apparently he decided to uh, yeah, go for an even juicier connection. Corruptors do get shot out of the sky as well, but I think that may have been a little bit too greedy there uh, by Serral. I guess this is uh, also him multitasking a ridiculous amount, right? Constantly hitting his opponent at multiple different angles at once. Beautiful micro here, though, by Maru. Constantly baiting the Zerg army to go off creep. So he can actually split his units more effectively against those uh, Banelings. Now, once again, I mean, these ghosts, they make short work of Ultralisks, man. How many are we on right now? Uh, we are currently at 13. Okay, so we did see a couple of them die, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so actually only two. Only two at this point. It's a good point right there uh, by Maru to keep all of those units alive. You don't want to have too many of them either. The problem is if you make too many ghosts, you just kind of die to Ling Bane. Which is, yeah, kind of funny because it's lower tech dealing with basically the ultimate tech of the Terran player. One thing you can easily add into the mix at this point as well is going to be the uh, the nuke, of course. Now, once again, beautiful splits there. Are you seeing the uh, the spread there on his, uh, on his Marauders in particular? 
really forcing a lot of that Zerg attention on the relatively small amounts of units there, while the, uh, the big beefy damage dealers there deal the damage from the distance. Nicely done there. The Marauders are kind of like the tank of this army. Once again, Zerklings going in for the counterattack. Love this idea, actually, from Maru. So I decided to make a planetary fortress in an unorthodox position, but it is going to be a little bit easier to now keep that expansion up and running. And he now also took care of one of those Zerg hatcheries. So nicely done there by Maru. Slowly gro uh, grabbing himself more and more uh, locations here on this map. He even managed to secure this area over here with a planetary. And uh, even though the traits, right? I mean, they haven't been... Oh my... Ooh. <laughs> Never mind. Forget whatever I was about to say. That is so many resources lost here for Zerg. That basically takes care of an entire additional expansion that the Zerg may have had during all of this game. I would love to actually see some transfuses on these Ultras. It's so helpful to keep those alive. Now actually, once you secure this position over here, right? Taking this base in the top left-hand corner is going to be significantly easier. So Maru may have actually just opened up the door to grabbing two new fresh bases. And at that point, we're talking about a split map scenario. And obviously, if you draw like a diagonal line right through the center of the map, um, you can imagine that if the Terran player is taking more efficient traits and they're mining an even amount, it's going to be the Terran player who will eventually come out ahead. Zerk late game is just really not... You know, their main strength. I mean, technically speaking, there's a lot of potential. Well, one of those ways is obviously the uh, the Infester. If you manage to land some good fungals, there certainly is a, a shot there. But already brilliant splits right here uh, by Maru. Still though, ooh, yeah, nice fungal growth there on a lot of these ghosts. But there's no follow-up at all. Because, I mean, that, that ghost flank was all the way there in the back of the army. Once again, though... Good fungal growths there do come out of Cerro, who's desperately trying to push back this army and trying to prevent that base from dying. Once again, I hear so many snipes going down. I see Ultralisks dying left, right, and center. An absolute slugfest of a battle. Maru right now backing up towards the safety of an orbital command. I don't know, man. If that was a planetary, this would have probably been an easier move to make. One more Widow Mine there explodes on top of those Corruptors as well. And well, Brenda and the rest of the crew are ready to uh, transfuse whatever units come back. Only a handful of those units actually managed to come home. Absolutely brilliant play here by Maru. Despite the fact that he was in a very rough position in the earlier stages of this game, he's playing this like an absolute god. This is so extremely difficult to play, right? Because, I mean, you're one bailing detonation on ghosts away from losing the game, right? That's, that's really what it comes down to. Widowmines scattered all over the map, though. And it makes it difficult for Zirkling run to still really happen. This is one of the things that uh, Serral obviously has been doing for a long time, but especially Raynor is really, really good at. Those Zirkling run have a lot of potential, but as long as you scatter a couple of Widowmines here and there, you can deal with a lot of those big Zirkling flanks relatively easily. Good splits there, though. Man, you gotta be so on point. Can we have a look right here at the actions per minute? Yeah, look at that. Both of these guys are playing so ridiculously fast. Oh my god. Alright. Casually 1000 APM. Guess he was morphing in Zerklings, huh? <laughs> if you morph into Zerkling, or sorry, if you like hold down the Zerkling button, uh, you make a lot of them. It, it spikes your APM up to a very high amount. Now, constant Zerkling burrows everywhere as well. So Saro is desperately trying to deny his opponent's economy. But exactly like I said here, right, the planetary fortress in this area creates like an anchor point for Maru to continue dominating this section of the map. I love it. The positional awareness here is super, super big. Once again, random widow mine. Good splits there once more. But I mean, the planetary fortress has already finished up at the same time. How is he even splitting those Zerklings there while he's dealing with an army over here too? I don't even know how that makes any sense. Like the multitasking is absolutely unreal. Did he, by the way, ever get Adrenal Glands? Oh my god, he never did. I don't know if it really would make much of a difference. I guess it would, though. Like, it really does add up. Um, yeah, he never got Adrenal Glands, so that certainly is a big mistake right there by Serral. Now, this is a good fight, though. A lot of these uh, Terra units are found here at a relatively, you know, easy position to uh, to surround them. At the same time, a couple Zerklings apparently have made their way to watch the main base here of the Terra player. Honestly, not having Adrenal Glands... It's so painful. It literally comes down to, I think, like 38 or so percent attack speed on Zerklings. 
And they are like the highest damage dealer uh, in, in this entire Zerg force. So that is certainly a, uh, a big error there by the finisher. And it may very well come to bite him in the butt here. I don't think he realized it, right? Like, there's no way that's intentional. Big mistake. Now that Terran has basically secured their side of the map, the inefficient traits are really starting to add up. <laughs> oh my god, well, speak of the devil. Ugh. Zerk at this point no longer capable of maxing out. Maru happily sitting at a very healthy amount of supply. And he also has a bit of a bank. GG gets cooled, and that means that Maru obtains the victory in game number one. Alrighty! So, as you might be aware, the new ladder maps are indeed live in StarCraft 2. So today it's time for my very first cast on a map that I have heard about 17 different pronunciations of so far already. If I'm not mistaken, the way you pronounce this is Jagannatha. <laughs> Jagannatha LE. I'm curious though to hear your thoughts on it. Maybe we should just refer to it as like Jag LE or something along those lines. Because I can guarantee you that everyone's gonna get it wrong. Even if I'm getting it right right now, which I'm pretty sure about, um, I'll probably get it wrong next time around. Just because it's such a, yeah, an unorthodox word for me to look at. But anyways, um, this map is by far the craziest of the new ladder maps. Now all of the new ladder maps are pretty tame. So just so you are aware, none of them are as crazy as like say a, uh, a Redshift Ellie that we saw a little while ago or like Battle of the Boardwalks or Battle on, uh, Battle on the Boardwalks. I don't remember exactly what it was called, but uh, that was a, a little while ago as well. That was also a bit of a crazy map. This map, while probably being the weirdest one in the current map pool, it's still relatively standard. I would say the most interesting features, or the most interesting feature rather, of this map are these big circle. Um, so they are at four different key locations, and they're big speed up circles. So essentially when units go through them, yo, could you display this to us, or uh, Ultralisk, Overlord, could you uh, show us real quick what these circles do? There you go, look how fast that guy is, insane. Is he purposefully actually routing them through these circles? Probably. He probably is, yeah. Anyways, um, so they basically speed up your units. Now, one thing that I found personally on this map is that being the aggressor is way easier. The thing is, right, there's a lot of ramps. So if you look right here from the side of the Zerg, right, there's one little ramp over here. Then if you take your base over here, there's a big ramp over here. And then this location, while there's technically three entrances onto it, right, as soon as you see like a little blip on the minimap, since they go through this circle, they seem to be over here pretty much right away. Um, so this this like you know section on the map it's it's really in a strategic position. Look at this look at this Reaper guy. Right? Are you seeing that? It's like the Formula One right over here, dude. Um, so at least in my experiences so far, being the aggressor seems to be favored. Just because I mean both of these guys obviously are very good at not dying to stupid stuff as we've already discussed. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's certainly a little bit easier if you are the most uh, the more aggressive player on a map like this. I've actually personally gone ahead and vetoed this map just because it is rather complicated to play on, especially with the play style that like I like to go for. So I like to play the more defensive style as well, just because it you know on paper it makes sense. But I've died to lots and lots and lots of timing attacks on this map already in like the dozen or so games that I've played on this map so far. Anyhow, we'll see how both of these guys decide to uh, approach it. So there are a pretty healthy amount of bases. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for for both. So there are quite a lot of bases. This base over here is covered by a bunch of rocks and some tall grass. There's actually a lot of those path blockers and site blockers all over the map, uh, which is also kind of neat. But other than that, I think it is pretty straightforward, right? So there are some nice, what we would like to call in the business, uh, pervert pillars. <laughs> Those are the locations where the overlords can hang uh, without really getting sniped too early on. Interestingly enough, Serral isn't even going for the one that seems like the most obvious one. He decided to hang out over here for a little bit, and now he's using this one for scouting the main base. Seems like this timing is a little bit late, though. I don't know. It seems like this is maybe a little bit of a later timing, or I might be mistaken. I guess he knows the timing of the Hellions. So he is going to be able to figure out exactly what his opponent is going for, so I guess it will be fine. There you go. 
So he sees indeed that there is a cloaking upgrade being researched, or what will pretty much always be a cloaking upgrade being researched there in the tech lab on the starport, as it is indeed going to be that Benchy opener here from Maru. He's mixing it up a little bit, but not too much as you can see. Even though Mech is relatively popular on the StarCraft 2 ladder, at this point we don't really see that much Mech on, uh, like at the highest level in tournaments. Every once in a while we do see it, but it seems like most of the top level Terran players are all favoring that biological army. And you can see Maru right now making the transition as well towards additional barracks. There's the NG base once more starting up in the back of the natural. I like this position a lot better, man. For a little while, it became common for Terran players to, like, build those NG bases as part of the wall of and stuff, and I wasn't a fan. Like, the amount of games that I saw those, uh... It's the same for Evo Chambers. Like, we saw Evo Chambers being used, like, say, over here at the third base as a wall of. Um, the amount of times that we saw those upgrades being denied, it was just painful. If you get your upgrades denied, right, and, and your opponent has his, it's, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna just be a, a significant, significant loss. Alrighty, so there's the Stimpak upgrade coming up. Probably will be seeing the plus one, plus one upgrades starting here in those engineering bays very, very shortly. Thought for a second this was a fourth hatchery here on the minimap. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's a little bit quick for a fourth, but I guess it's fine. I mean, if Serral's doing it, it probably is, right? We can't really critique these guys too much. There's the Spire. He's actually kind of late, though. Oh my god, look at these pro gamers making mistakes. What? Maru, hello. Uh, this is a big error actually for Maru. We just now saw, uh, I guess he's preoccupied or something. Like he just started off an engineering, or sorry, an armory. So he can start going into plus two, plus two right away. But he hasn't even started up plus one, plus one yet. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. what? You crazy man. Get him out of here. <laughs> Get that Venge out of there. He does manage to get a very healthy worker count, though. Yeah, nine workers there. One of the benches goes down, but I guess with the Muta transition, their days are numbered here anyway. Yo, hey, buddy. Buddy pal, come on. Oh, my God. He's probably going to find out as this armory finishes that he never started up 1-1. One, one. That's a big mistake. Now, luckily here for Maru, um, he, like, he's not dealing with a Zerg player here who's playing, like, aggressive Ling Bane with really quick upgrades. Luckily for Maru, yeah, now, oh my god, look at that. So he checked when the armory finished to start up 2-2, and he didn't even have 1-1 one, one yet. Ouch. Um, he actually, does he have, he hasn't started up Combat Shield either. Ooh, Maru is a little bit out of it here. So he started up Stimpak, and normally you go into Combat Shield right away. Yeah, he's certainly making a couple of errors here and there. I mean, we can look at the, at the actual battles. I know I sometimes get critique in the comment section that I don't look at the battles open enough, but these battles are... You know, nothing too exciting is gonna happen here, guys. <laughs> like, maybe a little bit, but it will probably be cleaned up. There you go. But this doesn't really matter too much in the big picture. Like, these upgrades are far more important. Anyways, uh, what I was trying to say. Luckily here for Maru, this is Serral opening up with a macro build. So he's going for a standard Spire opener, right? Going quickly into Mutalisks. Um, if this would have been, like, a double upgrade really early on with, like, a fast bailing speed upgrade... Sarah could like literally kill his opponent just with a 1-1 timing push. Which we don't really see Zerg players make very often, admittedly. But, uh, dude, he doesn't have combat shield. Hello. This is, a uh, like, it's super important. That's 10 hit points for every single Marine. I believe Marines have, what is it, like 45 hit points by default. So with combat shield, they get, like, 55. It's one of those upgrades, just like Adrenal Glands, that we see being forgotten every once in a while. Even at the highest level. Oof. Alrighty. Are you telling me pro gamers are not robots? I don't believe it. I thought they all worked at like Boston Dynamics or whatever. <laughs> I thought they were artificial intelligences. Oh my god, dude, speedy medevacs through these circles are really quick. Uh, he still has not started it up, guys. He still has not. It's actually crazy. Nicely done there. Serral grabs himself a Widowmine. Hey, there it is, by the way. Alright. Ooh, I love this. Do so you see that? So, if you fly in these Mutalisks, these Widowmines are likely gonna connect. So, luckily for him, he did notice, actually. Like, forgetting Combat Shield is probably... Uh, no, forgetting Combat Shield is certainly worse than forgetting... Uh, 
you know, the adrenal glands. It is just such an important timing attack uh, upgrade, right? Like, say he wants to go for a max dot push with 2-2. Well, I guess he would have already finished up 2-2, huh? But, um, uh, like, say he wanted to go for that kind of build. Uh, not having combat shield is just ridiculously painful. Once again, though, this kind of reminds me of the early game in the previous match. Saro is left to his own devices. Now, I was a little bit worried for Maru in game number one when this happened, because, I mean, leaving Saro completely alone seems like a mistake. Look at the creep spread already happening here on the map. This map is absolutely ginormous, and we're like 10 minutes into this game at this point, and Saro has basically covered, I would say, about 60% of it in that nice, gooey, purplish, gray stuff. What do you think it smells like? Random question. Let me know down below in the comment section. What do you think creep smells like? I think it's probably some sort of like, you know, foresty smell. Like some sort of earthy, decomposing, like, you know, what, what the forest smells like, especially in like autumn, you know? Oh, oh, the Widow Mines, the Widow Mines, the Widow Mines! Ah! There we go. <laughs> Thor coming in from the side as well. Grabs himself a kill there as the Mutas fly out. All right, so, um, to be fair though, it's not like Maru really had much of a choice, right? Completely butchering his upgrades, kind of put him up with his own back against the wall. He's got four bases, fifth command center is going to finish up as well. Six CC apparently will be starting up here too. Where do you take an expansion here if you're the Terran player? Probably top left, maybe here on the right hand side? I'm not sure, to be honest. Like, this is not an easy map to uh, expand on. Especially when the, the Zerk player is so active, right? With Ling, Bane, Muta pretty much all over your bases. Once more, Saro is sitting at 90-ish workers here. And he has been happily macroing, right? He's taken extra bases left, right, and center. Grabbing as many of those expansions as he possibly can. Similar approaches in the previous game. Just try and deny the opponent bases. And mine more stuff than they can. What went wrong there for Saro in the previous match is, well, first off, Adrenal Glance. I really, I can't emphasize enough how painful that is. Random mid-game Reaper. Um, but secondly, of course, his opponent managed to secure more bases, right? And you really want to try and prevent that if you are a Zerg player, because Terran becomes so scary, especially when they have 5 base eco. So, that's exactly what Saro is trying to do right now. Is he going to be able to grab those minerals, or those SCVs, rather, on the minerals? Uh, he decides to go for the planetary instead. Could maybe have grabbed a few more of those SCVs, but already a new command center is <laughs> ready to take its place. It's not a personal problem, okay? That that command center will just be replaced right away. At the same time, look at that. Another cheeky little uh, planetary fortress is coming in on the right-hand side. Saro doesn't currently know about this one, otherwise I think he would have tried to jump on it already. He'll probably check here in just a second, and you'll probably will find out, indeed, that it is going to be a planetary already in place. Eh, he could still go right now if he wants to, to be honest. Planetary is not done yet. Yeah, these mutas might actually just be enough right now to clean all of this up. Thors are a little far away as well, so maybe he can go after the planetary fortress. And then, indeed, pressure here on the left-hand side. Now, once again, beautiful splits there by the finisher. That is such a nice move. Planetary finishes up in this location too. Mutas. Okay, they were threatening to go into the main base, but instead they now run on over in the direction of that planetary fortress. Saro playing a textbook game here of Zerg versus Terran. Denies his opponent two eco uh, bases. They are so very critical here for the Terran player. Gets a couple of Widow Mines on his way out as well. Couple SCVs end up going down, but that's not the most important part. Maru eventually is gonna run out of stuff, right? He's just gonna run out of money. His mineral patches are already starting to look a little bit dire. He's now floating over an orbital command in this direction, which is just not ideal. And well, he will be able to continue mining here just fine. He's currently sitting at 73 SEVs, so that's not bad at all, especially with mules added into the mix. Um, it's just that he's running out of money here over like the next couple of minutes if he does not secure an additional base. There it is, by the way. Adrenal glance. Saral did get it this time around. Uh, he's getting plus three, plus three. Yeah, so normally, like I said, you go three, three, and Adrenal Glance at the same time, and that's just the way you approach the game. Alrighty. All these Widow Mines, man. There's so many of them just scattered constantly all over the map. 
It's so easy to like lose all of this to one accidental window mine. Once again. Sarah's playing cautiously. The thing is, right, all these traits are inefficient. It's not like Zerk is gonna take like a really wonderful engagement there and get like, you know, lots of value for their uh, their minerals and gas spent. It's just that he's got way more income here all this time already. Going for more and more bases pretty much all over the map. There's cheeky widow mines hiding behind structures all over the place, just barely out of line of sight. I love it. Bailings though, come rolling up once again. Are the ghosts gonna be ready to run for their lives? Run for the CC. Well, I mean, that was pretty good. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, oh, oh, oh my god. He keeps most of them alive there, which is nice, but already, I mean, this is a bit of a disaster here for the Terran player. Because, uh, I mean, he's got minerals, he's got, you know, good upgrades, he's got gas, he's got a good amount of CCs. It's just that he, he doesn't have as much as his opponent. Now, obviously, as discussed, Zerg late game is certainly not their strong suit. Usually, Zerg late game is mostly just about more mid game, <laughs> some more Ling Bane. It is a very swarmy style, which I am a very big fan of. I have become more critical though of the Ultralisk, because they certainly seem to be like the worst unit that Zerg can make right now. Um, I mean, the Brute Lord is probably even worse, but I mean, what is your alternative? Probably Lurkers, actually. I'm a big fan of the Lurker play. But Ghosts are good against those as well, so... I, I don't know. Like, Marauders, Thors, Widow Mines, and especially Ghosts, and then also Liberators, if you were to make those, deal really well with Ultras, right? So, like, pretty much all these Terran units are good against Ultras, other than Marines. So, I'm a big fan of switching into Ultras myself when the Terran player is stuck on just Marine tank. But, I mean, when you're in an even or behind game, it's a little tricky. Now, here we go. Zerk units come in from every single angle. This may very well be the, the way to engage this. Bane Links. Ooh, once again, hunting for the ghost. And this is probably gonna be the connection? Ooh, maybe? Question mark? Oh, okay. There we go. That the Zerk player is looking for. In the meantime, he also ended up cleaning up the base there on the right-hand side. And that puts Maru in a very rough spot. Despite the fact that Saro had to spend a lot of his bank right now to remax once more, uh, he is going to be able to do so. Top left and base never acquired. Yeah, now that I'm looking at this at this map from like you know uh, an observer's point of view, it seems to me that Terran has a very hard time securing a fourth or sorry a fifth base. So, securing four bases is really no problem, but, you know, going from there into, like, their late-game armies is gonna require a fifth expansion, and he just never really had it. So, the creep spread here is ridiculously good as well for Saro. Pretty much everywhere he goes, he's met by creep. I mean, Saro doesn't even need that hatch. No cancel on that one. But, I mean, he doesn't really care, right? He's got a lot more bases in other locations as well. This has been Saro winning for like the last 15 minutes. And uh, while there technically is a chance that Maru could come back into it, I think that's only gonna happen with a enormous blunder for Saro. And I don't really... Yeah, I don't really see him doing that. No, I like this. Okay. So this is really nice. Maru finally has decided to take a stance over here on the low ground. Now, the low ground obviously is not a preferable position to be in. But with this, this Widow Mind spread over here and just like the position in general, I don't mind it, right? So finally he now secured a fifth command center. That's super important. And I don't really know exactly if Zork is going to be able to break it while Saro's going to try. This Widow Mind spread is phenomenal though. Stimpak is being used very rapidly on a lot of these units as well. I guess there's a couple of Zerklings over at the fourth base. So Theron decides to split off a little bit too many units or a few too many units. Maru, look at that. Takes a good trade there regardless. Alrighty, so that's the strength of Terran, right? When you're forcing them to fight off creep, you can clean up those Zerklings, Banelings, and Ultras so much easier. Look at the resources spend again. Even though Sero has had, like, an additional two bases, he's not really getting a lot of money. Apparently another command center is gonna float on over in this direction as well. Don't think that that one's gonna achieve too much. There's one Zerkling underneath, man. Literally impossible to land. Even though I feel like this command center could just crush the Zerkling. 
Especially when the Zerkling is burrowed on the ground and then the command center tries to... How? How does the command center not land? Ah, it's blocked. <laughs> don't know how it's blocked, but don't worry about it. It's one of the things that science just can't explain. Well, there's only a couple of SCVs here remaining. That CC is starting to burn. Still though, there's Widow Mines, of course. Scattered all over the place. So I guess that this base will... Uh... Oh my god, that's a little cheeky, huh? <laughs> I guess that this base may finally go up. And you know what? Honestly, if he manages to get that base up and running, he's gonna be fine. That said, as soon as uh, the Terran player is moving towards the right-hand side of the map, we see a lot of Zerg units moving towards the top left-hand corner. You don't need all of your army there. Yeah, just a couple of Zerglings will do the trick. They're going to be able to bite and gnaw through all of these Terran SCVs and mules very, very rapidly without a planetary fortress. At the same time, Maru finally is finding a little bit of harassment over here of his own. Decides to drop out one sad marauder on top of a bunch of banelings. Good trade there once again, just trying to obtain value. With this base now acquired, though, this may be reasonable. Man, this needs to be a planetary. Like, not, not having these outer bases be planetary fortresses is pretty much impossible. Like, how are you gonna hold on to them? You're just not gonna be able to. I mean, maybe he can hold on to this one if he, like, has his entire army over here. But five bases, still not, you know, ideal. Especially not against seven base Zerk. Well, here we go. Once again, so many bailings are added into the mix. Serral is losing so much money, but he's playing hyper-aggressively as well. And I think it's working, man. Even though he, he employed a very similar style last game. Here we go. Ooh, SCVs could have been in a little bit of trouble. Well, I see that. Look at this. Maru, actually, with a significantly smaller amount of supply, still stands his ground. He's got tons of Widow Mines in the back. I wouldn't even mind seeing those indeed on Burrow and brought with the army. This may very well be his opportunity to shine. Serral is going to end up losing an expansion over here. Medifex are present, but here come the reinforcing 60-odd Zerklings. And they're going to be absolutely phenomenal when it comes to fighting a Marauder-based army. Man, what a slugfest. This just really, like, shows you how ridiculously resilient Maru is. <laughs> how many Terran players would have lost at this point already? Saro has been relentless with the aggression, right? Constantly denying eco left, right, and center. But Saro, I mean, even though you're trading ridiculously inefficiently, your Terran opponent is yet to roll over and actually lose. I can imagine there are so many games where Maru is just forcing his opponent to lose like 30,000 more resources just by trading like a champion. I've casted so many several, or sorry, like I've casted like a bunch of Maru games recently where he goes for this exact same approach every single time. And oftentimes, even when he's behind, he still somehow is ahead because he doesn't die. You can't make that much Terran on four bases, but apparently you can still make quite a bit. Maybe very much so enough as well. Now, I mean, this is now 32 SCVs on one base. I think a couple more. Yeah, there we go. Are rallying over in that direction. As soon as the Terran is focusing their attention on the left-hand side of the map, Zerklings are running on the right-hand side of the map because that's what we've seen this entire game so far. All right. I wonder if Serral should actually be taking these bases now, right? Because eventually they will be mined out. Look at the ghosts. Oof, that's one sad Ultralisk. Or Ultralisk, rather. Once again, a couple Zerklings left in the top left-hand corner. They're going to be able to get rid of a lot of those SCVs very quickly. You blink twice and the entire mineral line is gone. Looks like the ghost will be able to at least snipe down a couple of Corruptors. But I'm pretty sure if I look at that supply count right now that this is going to be all she wrote right here for Maru. I mean, yeah, there we go. He doesn't have the income anymore. He loses his last SCVs as well. And Serral evens up the score. Alrighty, so here we go. The final map of this best of three series is Lightshade. Now, obviously, we had Nightshade. But this is a bit of a different map. This one was added with the new ladder season just a couple of days ago. Let me try and show you around as this game gets underway. Um, this is a very familiar layout. So if you've played any StarCraft 2 over the years, you'll probably recognize at least some elements of this map. So standard main base, standard natural, no ramp leading down from the natural, just a standard choke point right over here, uh, which can sometimes create a bit of an aggressor's advantage, but eh, I'm not entirely sold on that in uh, 
you know, most of the situations. You can expand vertically here if you want to. Most of the time, though, Terran and Protoss players like taking the triangular base, try to expand in the direction of the Zerg, which I am a big fan of as well whenever I play Terran, just because it shortens the distance that you need to travel to get across the map. From there, I mean, there are very standard bases to be acquired in pretty much all locations. Um, this is a very wide open area, but there are a couple of pathing blockers uh, in this area. Otherwise, I, uh, I would have definitely called this a significant advantage for Zerg. Um, but uh, yeah, they can't just come streaming from every single direction super easily. Still though, a very good Zerg map at the very least from what I've gathered so far. Um, the rush distance though from natural to natural in particular is rather short. So you can go across the map relatively easily. Once again, there's a lot of this tall grass. Apparently that's the decoration that players or rather map makers have gone for this time around. Uh, this tall grass, not only can you find Pokemon over there, super convenient. If you look hard enough, um, they also obviously hide some of your opponent's vision. Say you have units on this side, you don't have a high ground unit over here like Serral does, but say your units are on this side, your opponent won't be able to see them, even if they have units standing right here against the bushes. Yeah, and other than that, I mean, nothing too crazy. Nothing too crazy. <sighs> I gotta say though, so far, laddering in this new season has been an absolute blast. It's been fantastic. It's been really good to uh, get some new maps out once again. I mean, the thing is, if you play a lot of StarCraft 2, if you play like a bunch of ladder games pretty much every single day, um, then the maps do become a little bit... Oh, he could have denied that. Wow, he didn't even check. Anyways, the maps do sometimes become a little bit tedious. Especially like Golden Wall or like Everdream. It's not that they are bad maps. I, I actually really loved playing on Everdream and Golden Wall. But they had been around for such a long time, you know? Oh, nice. Nicely done there. Gets himself a drone kill. Now, obviously, he did take a lot of damage there as well on the Reaper, so... There's no chance that that Creep Tumor is gonna go up contested, but... I like it. Oh, okay, so there's a little jump up pad right over here too, it looks like. Look at Karen over there on the high ground. Man, she looks menacing, right? Imagine you jump up there with your jetpacks and your two guns in your hands. Yeah, I'd, I'd jump back down really quickly as well if I was a Reaper. Interestingly enough, actually, Serral decided to go for this base over here. Hmm. Yeah, it's a little too early to tell which the expansion patterns should be. But um, generally speaking, right, if you're not sure what to do, copying the best players <laughs> is a good idea. Right? If you're like a Protoss player out there, you might want to copy what Trap or Stats or say like a Showtime are doing. Very defensive players in general. And if you're a Terran player... Just go for, like, Innovation or Maru's openers. And if you're a Zerg player, well, you can pick up a whole bunch, but I think Serral is going to be a pretty good starting point. I will try and actually cover some more games on these new maps if I can get the replays um, over these next couple of weeks as well. So make sure to subscribe in case you're interested in watching some more of that content. I actually went into my analytics recently, and, like, half the people that watch my videos aren't subscribed. Guys. Guys, come on. Bro. <laughs> bro, come on, bro. <laughs> what, what's up with that? We should be able to get that up to like 70%, right? So 70% of the viewers just subscribed and 30% isn't. But right now it's like 50-50. Maybe I need to start every video with like, Subscribe to Loco Television! Maybe, maybe that's how I should start every video. That will probably help, right? <clears throat> that's not obnoxious at all! Anyhow, um, standard openers. Guess what? Once again from both players. Maru going for the bio follow-up, going for the triple CC opener, going into a little bit of Hellion harassment after that very first Reaper. Now, it's only four Hellions here, and this obviously has been noted by Sero as well, so he knows I can't really get aggressive, right? I can't really get aggressive. There's the 1-1 upgrade starting, hopefully, maybe, this time around. Come on, Maru. I mean, he doesn't have the money for it just yet, but he's soon approaching the amount of gas that he requires. Maru, come on, bro. Mar Maru. Do you think Maru is subscribed to my YouTube channel? There it is, by the way. He started it up. Nice. Nah, Maru definitely isn't. Is Serral, though? Maybe. Maybe. Double uh, Evo Chamber. Lair. Bailing Nest. Very, very macro-focused opener here by Serral, right? So this is kind of the bread and butter of Zerg these days. I personally... So... 
it's kind of interesting. I would say that the best Zerg versus Terran player in the world is probably actually Raynor. Raynor has looked ridiculously good at not playing this, like, Muta style necessarily. I mean, he's very, very good at that as well, don't get me wrong. But he's very good at the double Evo Chamber opener, where you basically delay your, uh, your mid-game tech quite a bit. But he's also extremely good at playing that uh, Lurker style, right? And those seem to be, I don't know, like, interestingly enough, and I don't quite understand why this is, it seems to be only Raynor that's really playing that Lurker style at this point. Pretty much all the other pro gamers are still favoring the Mutas or the Hydras or just the Link Bane into really quick Ultras or something along those lines. Here we go, by the way. So this is a little bit of a different start here for Serral. Okay, so he decided to go into the Hydra then here. Going into 1-1, one, one, going into Bailing Speed. My problem with Mutas mostly comes from Thors and Widow Mines. <laughs> Just like with everyone else, unless you like, you know, are one of the best micro players in the world, like Serral. It's very difficult to keep your mutas alive. Now this little timing here from Maru is quite good. It's a bit of an anti-timing actually, because he hasn't finished up his 1-1 one -one upgrades and he hasn't finished up Combat Shield either. Which makes his whole process a little bit odd. Ooh. Okay, he overstayed his welcome for just a little bit. Now, I can kind of excuse that kind of move there. I mean, he picked up his marines like a split second too late. The reason for that is probably the server ping. So, obviously, Serral is currently in uh, in the beautiful country of Europe. Um, in the city of Finland. Uh, and, and Maru is over in South Korea, right? So, usually the way that they play these kind of games out is on the uh, NA West server. Which is like the worst of both worlds. <laughs> but basically, like, you know, geographically where they would kind of meet in the center. That's the best server for them with ping. But obviously they would still be playing with like 150 ping, which is like 100 ping more than they probably play on their natural servers. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that with like 100 ping less, would have Maru or would Maru have picked up those marines in time? Probably. Probably. Either that or it was a mistake, but that's that sounds crazy to me. Mistakes? What? No. I wonder actually if Serral decides to go for this uh, Lurker style in this game. I would love to see it. So, from the uh, the games that I've watched, I didn't actually see this game very closely at all. So, I uh, I know ends up winning this entire series, but I haven't actually seen this matchup or this map very closely. Um, at least not compared to the previous ones. So, I was actually thinking that Serral was playing Mutas on this map too, but... A little bit of a different approach. So, by the way, if you are a ladder player, I highly recommend you play this Hydra Link Bane style rather than the Muta Link Bane style. Mostly because the Muta Link Bane style is uh, significantly more intense. Like, Zerg vs Terran with creep spread and macro and all that is hard enough as it is. If you have to add an additional 100 or so APM just to control your Mutas, it's very hard. I mean, you can obviously, don't get me wrong, it's very good, but... As the Terran army is distracting the Zerg in the middle of the map, we do indeed now see a small little hit squad once again moving in this direction. Going after the Queens this time around. Good micro there though by Serral. Keeps both of those alive. Actually, there were three of them, but you know, they're, they're alive. It's the most important part. All right, so there's the infestation pit. Probably will be transitioning here towards a hive and then I guess a, a lurker den. Are we gonna see a lurker den? I mean, it should start up here any second. Mm, maybe not. Maybe he's just gonna go Hydraling Bane into uh, Ultralisks. Yeah, I think so. Good defense though here so far by Serral. A couple Medivacs apparently donated. Only one Medivac in the end, but... Notice here though, the mindset difference, right? If you compare it to the previous games. So the Hydraling Bane style is way more passive. Serral is not really bothering with his opponent's side of the map at this point at all. With the Mutaling Bane style, you really want to be in your opponent's face and you want to try and, uh, you know, be aggressive and hit your opponent at multiple angles, and that works really well, but I think this one is just a little bit more straightforward to play, especially if you're uh, a ladder hero. Good splits there once again by the finisher. The only downside, though, is obviously that Maru is now going up to watch four bases without any contest whatsoever. Fifth base may very well be acquired here in just a little bit as well. Serral did see this command center landed, so even though there's a change thing over there, he does know about the fact that his opponent is already grabbing a fourth. It's important to note that, because if the Terran player decides to stick on three bases, they will probably go for one of those parade pushes through the center of the map. So seeing your opponent grab a fourth base at a reasonable time is very, very helpful. Adrenal glands? Nah, I don't think we're going to be seeing Lurker then, guys. Makes no sense. I would like to see Serral actually play that style. 
So usually what Raynor does in this scenario, oop, whoa, <laughs> massive hits there. I love it. Nicely done. Um, usually what, um, what, what, what Raynor does in these kind of scenarios is that he starts up the Lurker then as he starts up the Hive. And then he goes straight into the, the Lurker upgrades at Hive Tech, right? So a couple of Vipers here obviously makes a lot of sense as well. Maybe this is actually Serral trying to like play a, a bit of a clever mind game here as well. Making his opponent think that this is going to be that scary European Lurker follow-up. But uh, it's it's not. Nah, she's going to be no for Kevin. Cool. I'm actually going to have a look at this replay later today on stream. I want to study this game in particular, because this is exactly the way that I like to play Zerg. And, um, I mean, may as well take the master class as it comes, right? So maybe I'm focusing a little too much attention here on Serral. Um, but, uh, that's just because I'm a bit of a nerd, guys. I like StarCraft, okay? Unlike many other casters out there, I actually play the game. Oh, shots fired! <coughs> Sorry, sir. Um... Sorry, I couldn't resist, guys. Been solo casting for too long. I gotta fire shots at someone, okay? Apparently at everyone is the way to go. Now, finally, apparently, this is the moment where Serral decides to be a little bit aggressive, but once more, Maru shows us how to defend at multiple angles as well. Hmm. I mean, to be fair, most of the StarCraft casters do play the game as well. Not everyone, though. <laughs> ooh, 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 I love the bushes here, man. You start looking for uh, a Pokemon, right? You go into the high yield or the, the, the tall grass there to, to find a Pokemon, and all you find is a bunch of Baylings. <laughs> kind of sad, really, dude. You brought your Pokeballs and everything, and then you die. Anyways, big engagement here, though, by Sarah. Ooh, he's going really deep off the creep. This is a bit of a strange moment as well, because this is before he actually finished up his 3 3 upgrades. Apparently, he saw an opportunity and just blows up the freaking planetary. Maybe he looked at his bank and he thought, okay, yep, <laughs> I've got 5,000 minerals and 5,000 gas in the bank. I mean, combined, let's go. Um, seemed like a very aggressive move there by the finisher, but I like it, man. Maybe he knew that his opponent's army was kind of focused on the top section of the map instead, but he decides to just go balls to the wall right now, despite the fact that he actually hasn't finished up his hype tech upgrades yet. He could have done this push like two minutes ago and had the exact same upgrades. That's so crazy. Normally, whenever you see players committing this much money into into upgrades, right? Like that's like a thousand minerals and a thousand gas, or maybe even more. Uh, you wait until those upgrades finish up because, I mean, hypothetically speaking, your army could have been way more powerful if you didn't get those at that specific mo moment in the game. But, hmm, very cool. Okay. Already, do we see a ghost transition right now from Maru? Ghost transition. Wait, no. That's ghost deficient. Yikes. Sabaton song. Man, the more I solo cast, the weirder these games become. I was such a professional in game number one and two, but right now, man. Ooh, the Bailings hunting for whatever they can, and while that's all going on, right, that mineral line is being eaten. Saro is in firm control of this game over here. I think Maru was probably anticipating that Muta style once again, or maybe the Lurker transition, because, I mean, he, he certainly has been... It's not like he he has taken that much damage here in the grand scheme of things throughout this game, but he's being absolutely overrun here by Serral. Serral just sort of let him do whatever he liked in the first, I would say, like 10 minutes of this match. And now all of a sudden everything is going way south. Maybe it's because he took that fifth base rather greedily. Right now he's grabbing another fifth base though. This time around in the top right hand corner. This area is uh, difficult to engage, I would say, as a Zerg. Double Spire? Okay then. Double Spire? Huh. Where is that gonna go? Planetary Fortress, though, gets cancelled right away. Love the fact, actually, that there's a Siege Tank transition. So, Lynx, once more, will be engaging over here at the third base, but, I mean, this base is close to mined out anyway. Um, normally, Hydras, right, they counter Widow Mines, which is probably the reason why we see Maru now taking the uh, transition here towards Siege Tanks in this game instead. So, Siege Tanks... They're very good against Hydras, not so good against Mutas. Mutas very weak against Widow Mines, but Hydras very good against Widow Mines. There you go. That made some sense, right? I'm hoping so, anyway. Alright, so, once again, attempt number two on the Planetary Fortress over here. 
Apparently, though, this is the moment where Serral once again decides to engage. Love the siege tank positioning. Really good stuff there, but... Turns out those, uh... Those Vipers don't really care where your units are on the high ground. Still, I mean, that was a nice little fight and all for Serral. But this is giving that planetary fortress the precious time that it needs to go into the, uh... Well, I guess the, the... What is this called? I mean, it's like a, a big cannon on top of a command center. Why can't I not make an orbital on top of the planetary fortress? Why can't we not stack this, man? We must build it higher. Double planetary. On one CC. I would still die to mainlings. Anyways, here we go. We do see some uh, some decent blinding clouds there. Could have blinding clouded the uh, planetary itself too, but I mean, even though... Ooh, well, there's some ghosts now coming in from the back. I was going to say, even though the fact that there's a planetary fortress there at this point, looks like Serral doesn't really care. Once again, engages with lots of units in lots of different locations. And this is like kind of the story of this entire series so far, right? Serral has had the income advantage in the earlier stages of the game because Maru let him. Right? Maru really hasn't been putting any pressure on. Because of that, Serral, while he is taking very inefficient trades, and he's making units here in the late game that are kind of considered to be trash, like this, this big boy right over here, um, they're not efficient traders, but he doesn't care about efficient trades because he's mining so much more. Look at this, once again. All of these, like, Banelings are not cheap, guys. Banelings are not cheap, look at that. He's already lost thousands more resources than his opponent, but he doesn't care. He knows that as long as he manages to like... Oh, 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 oh. Okay, then. Wow. <laughs> as long as... That's a minefield. As long as he like takes more traits constantly and he knows his opponent is only going to be on X amount of bases, he will eventually win, win the game. He always makes sure that he's got some money in the bank. Yeah, and it's working out brilliantly. Uh, good pick up there once again on the Medivex. This time around, apparently, all of the Zerg units will be focused on one location. Siege tanks there fighting underneath a blinding cloud, meaning that a bunch of them won't be able to really get a good uh, hit in. Palings trying to see if they can go after the ghosts. A couple of them end up going down there. Most of them are inside of those Medivex. But once more, while this is all going on, that base is not mining. This base is not mining. Serral is grabbing an expansion that was previously the Terrans. Um... Yeah, this is going from bad to worse right now. And I'm wondering what would have happened, actually, if Serral decided to get himself Adrenal Glands in game one. Imagine that. Could it have already been 2 to 0? Maybe? I don't know. What's most surprising to me, right, is that despite the fact that Zerk is getting nerfed constantly, pretty much every single patch there's a Zerk nerf, Serral and Raynor seems to s seem to still do it. It's so it's so hard. Like, I know some people only watch the games that are casted, right, and they don't actually play that much. Um, this may look like unfair or whatever, but I really want to emphasize how many Zerg units lose their entire army to one min one widow mine. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, and that hasn't really happened too often anymore in in these you know top level pro games, but. It is so easy to accidentally take a tr like a bad trade. Like this little pullback there by Serral is such a high level move. It doesn't look like a lot, but losing 40 bailings there or so for free is not ideal, right? But a lot of people while while they're harassing over on this side of the map will then not be paying attention to this area of the map and like both Serral and Raynor are making these constant judgment calls that are extremely difficult to actually you know make in in less than uh, you know half a second. Anyhow, I hope I'm trying to, or I hope I'm making some sense there. But, uh, yeah, it's it's impressive. It's very impressive to me. Maru's making the best of this, though, but I'm wondering if his strategy in the early game is just a little too passive. Actually, I know that his strategy in the early game is just a little bit too passive. He could probably win a lot of games against weaker Zerg players because of exactly what I was describing just now. But look at Serral. He is ready. To drive it home. He's bringing his entire army to watch this section of the map. GG is called. And Serral obtains the victory in a best of three series in a 2 to 1 fashion over Maru. I hope you enjoyed watching this series. If you did, hit that like button down below. If you want to see more, make sure you hit that subscribe button. A special shout out, of course, to the Patreon supporters. Thank you guys very much for your generosity. But for now, I want to thank you for watching. Have an awesome day. 
don't forget to smile. And I'll see you once again in the next one.